I met a lot of folks who are co-founder dating. It's not always the case. And when money starts to come in, things get weird. Yeah, Everybody yeah, knows yeah. that. People get greedy typically and things just change. And so my suggestion would be. Is there is there any one or two points that like downtime for you in this journey? God, it was extremely stressful. It just always seemed like something was going to put the company out of business. Could happen any day. So we were constantly figuring out everything. <laughs> Finally got to the point where we had a run rate of a million dollars a year. That would change our system a lot. Like we ended up buying a company. Hey guys, welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on Stacy. Stacy was an entrepreneur in residence at Curious Minds Inc. After which she co-founded Telesign, which was a product of the incubator Curious Minds Inc. She was at Telesign for quite a while until it was acquired by BICS, Bix. Bix. Mm -hmm. And after that, she's been an advisor to various startups and is currently working on a stealth company. Welcome to the show, Stacey. Thank you. Great to be here. One thing I wanted to ask was, after your MBA, why go and become an entrepreneur in residence? It's I not a traditional path. And why, why choose that path? What excited you about that? Yeah, definitely not a traditional path at all. I actually didn't get an MBA, so I came straight out of undergrad at USC. Uh, I did do a business major with an entrepreneur emphasis, yeah. So, um, but I definitely did not take a traditional path. So when I graduated, this was the time when people who graduated and didn't know what they want to do with their lives went to that law school. So I actually took the LSAT. I was all geared up to go to law school. I worked at a law firm for like six months, hated it hated everything about it and decided that I wanted to do something else. And I had art, always been sort of a techie person. So I started coding when I was 12 and just sort of taught myself and ended up seeing this post out uh, in the world. I don't even know where I found it. <clears throat> that was for a um, an incubator, which in 2005, and this was LA, it's yeah. not even San Francisco, yeah. Los Angeles, 2005, an incubator was like, a very different type of a thing. It did not have a formula like it does today, but the post was just like, come help us build businesses. And to me, that sounded super cool. So I just went in and started chatting with them and ended up joining the incubator. Um, so that's really how it got, it got started. And I was never the kind of person that just felt like I was going to take a tra traditional path. Well, I guess when I was Thinking about going to law school, I was trying to sort of fit myself into yeah. the traditional path, but it just it wasn't for me. So joining the incubator, what were some of the ideas you tested out? How many ideas were you testing out before you landed on Telesign? So we tested out a ton of ideas. Telesign was actually the first one we started with, but it it took a while to take off. So we sort of started Telesign. They were like, we don't know if this one's going to take off. We're going to work on some other things as well. So we tested. Gosh, I don't know. We did, um, for example, one called Doctors on Demand, which was doctors over a phone call, because this was really before you could really do a video call. Um, we tested one called Do My Stuff, which was kind of like TaskRabbit is today, very similar. Um, we did one, I don't even talk about this one very often because it's kind of embarrassing, but we actually did a lot of press for this one and do my stuff. It was called Pooch IQ. So it was, if you have a dog, you could take their, you could do an IQ test That's on great. your dog. Yeah. So we did several, um, there was a few others, uh, celebrity on demand actually, which was kind of like, I feel like all of these ended up getting made eventually. Um, so it's kind of like, um, what is that company called where you can sort of have a celebrity say something? Cameo. Cameo. Kind yeah. of like Cameo, but it was more like just have a conversation with a celebrity. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there was a ton of things that we worked on, but Telesign was really the one that showed the most revenue potential, to be honest. That's that's why we ended up working on it. I would it. say a lot of hard-hitting ideas just a little early before. Mm, a little before early. Before time, right? If you could pick any one idea or just talk more generally, how are you guys sort of honing down on an idea and mm -hmm. then validating the idea? Because there's a lot of ways to go about that. Yeah. And wanted to sort of break that down for anyone listening. I feel like it's become much more of a formula than it was for us back then. So again, this was like 2005, 2006, 2007. So we would just quickly build something, throw it out into the ether 
go, we what we would try to do because this was really before social media. Um, the way that we went after clients, which I guess would be sort of like the validating phase, was different for each one. So like for Telesign, we sent out a ton of emails. That was our main source of trying to you know get feedback from clients. Send out emails, see what happened. With, for example, Do My Stuff and Pooch IQ, we did a lot of press. Like we went after the press. We would send press releases and we had a whole list of um, press people that we would reach out to. And so, for example, with those, what would happen is we get a bunch of press. We get a lot of people, you know, coming to the business and either making purchases or using the service. And then we would see like how much revenue are we actually making off of this and how much work are we doing? So for example, Pooch IQ was very work intensive. It was like, you have to pack things up and yeah. send it out. Um, with Do My Stuff, we didn't have a good revenue model. We had a really like interesting business. We had a lot of people that wanted to use it, but we didn't really know how to make money off of it per se. So that's, I would just say we didn't have a specific formula, but we just kind of got a sense after seeing how people interacted with the business and um, whether we could turn a profit, uh, essentially. Um, that's how we finally made the decision to focus in on Telesign. And so when you're doing press, sending emails, have you already built an MVP by then? Are you doing more of what people call like a landing page approach nowadays where you're just putting up a marketing page with like um, a sign up sheet or a waiting list? So we had very basic MVPs. So for uh, like Pooch IQ, we had the we had the elements of it, but it's not like we had like a manufacturer that we were working with or anything like that. We just had the elements that we would source from like stores, essentially yeah. um, with do my stuff. We had a, uh, an MVP, but it was based on like we didn't build it. It was based on some software that was already available, like a software package that you could use for um, sort of like an eBay or like a, a classified type of thing that we just customized. So it was not an intensive amount of work that we put into it before we went out to market got and, and got feedback. Now that did cause problems. I mean, we had like the site crashed multiple times um, because we just weren't prepared and it wasn't architected for so much traffic. But a uh, good problem to have. It was a good problem to have at the time. Yeah. And even Telesign, um, we actually did quite a bit more work on that one uh, because it was very difficult back then. It wasn't like you could just, you know, uh, set up an account on some website. I don't really want to call out any of our competitors, but like, set, you know, and send like VoIP calls or text yeah. messages or whatever we had to actually hook up to like a what was called a pri line which is a line from at&t that came into our office and hooked up to servers that were meant to send calls um because that's how at the beginning we were sending calls rather than text messages so it was like that one was pretty technically intensive before we could even offer the product makes sense and uh, quickly taking a step back so you joined the incubator can you quickly describe how the incubator was structured how many people were there? Was everyone working on all the ideas? Was the goal of the incubator to find one banger idea and like everyone shift gears there? Or what was the overall structure? The structure was very loose, but basically what it was was a bunch of resources. So we had a couple of several actually technical resources that we could use there. We had the guy who started it, which was basically our mentor. So he could be thought of as like a business resource. We could bounce ideas off of him. He Got always it. had a lot of feedback. So what we had there was resources. Um, and then a few people like myself and Darren, who's one of the co-founders and Ryan, one of the co-founders and a few other people who were actually sort of in charge of starting the businesses okay. and using okay. those resources. Um, but it was never going to be like everyone in the incubator would turn and focus on it. one it was like a few people who were starting maybe that one would focus then in on one if it started to take off and maybe we'd pull some resources or maybe not um and then really hone in on that and start building an organization makes sense mm -hmm. um can you talk about the structure and how that worked with the incubator and what i'm trying to get at is a lot of listeners who are early stage builders get the opportunity to go to a lot of accelerators, incubators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But structures can be very great, can be very loose. Um, can you briefly describe what the structure was um, and what you would recommend in terms of how to best use an incubator? 
So again, I just like our structure was very loose. Everything about that incubator was, was extremely loose and we were kind of just sort of making things up as we went along. My, you know, everyone, I would say everyone that I worked with there was just a really good person, luckily for me. And we just all got along really well. And so I don't, I'm sure that's not always the case. And when money starts to come in, things get weird. Yeah. Everybody yeah, knows yeah. that. People get greedy typically and things just change. And so my suggestion would be to have everything really buttoned up and in writing when you go in, know exactly what you're getting into because you never know what's going to happen. I feel like for us, it was very loose and we had to all come to an agreement, um, but we were able to do that because we just worked really well together. Um, it's funny you say that. I have this random story I bring up from my undergrad where a bunch of us friends were doing hackathons and going to accelerators and um, trying to pitch ideas, make ideas and MVPs. Mm -hmm. And one of them won. And um, there was promise of going to a three, four month accelerator, 30, 40 K. And this was back in 2014. Uh, and we were in India. So 40 K was a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. The second that became a thing, it was like, oh, we were six, seven people building an idea, but it very quickly became, oh, no, but like, I want 18%. No, you get 6%. I'm like, how are you making these conclusions? Yeah. Because up until now, it was everybody, let's just find an idea that works. But it's funny that if you don't have those things understood, both from a point of view of equity plus cash compensation, plus expectation, right? Mm -hmm. um, I work with a lot of founders here who tell me that hey my CTO is taking two months off okay and um like this was the arrangement but I'm like you don't have anything written in stone and now, now you're in a weird situation where you're trying to do sales but like you need feature dev but they're not available but like they own 50 percent like there's a lot of these weird situations yeah and if you're not written in stone it becomes very hard to like counteract those battles right a hundred percent. The more that you can have written down, the better, because then you can point to that and be like, this was our agreement. You know, otherwise you might have an agreement in your head yes. and they have another agreement in their head and you don't, you think you're matched and aligned, but you're not. And yeah, I mean, once money comes into the picture, people just <laughs> start, start grabbing what they can in some cases. And you don't really know what's going to happen. You might think that you know someone really well, but then you don't. So I don't really like, like, what we did is not what you should do. Like, yeah, I got yeah, lucky. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, definitely write things down. <laughs> yeah. So you guys are testing out the idea. Some are failing. Some are working. What was the turning point for which you guys saw that, okay, TeleSign could be the one? It's a really good question. I think there was a couple of turning points. One was... Like, so I don't really remember what things I've signed, like NDAs and stuff. So I'm not going to name yeah, yeah. any of our like actual clients. All the NDAs have probably expired at this point, but just in case. So we started working, I'll just say, with a large classified website. And they were having a lot of um, uh, fraud-related problems. And we were, you know, they installed our system for some of the categories. And we would literally watch... We knew what the fraudsters we do, were doing. We knew where they were communicating. And so we would go on these message boards, the black hat message boards, basically, and watch the fraudsters and see what they were saying. And so we, long story short, classified ads company installed our system. It worked for a while. Like we saw, they saw the fraud drop tremendously. And then the fraudsters, the scammers, they always adjust and they find new ways to do things. And we saw that they were adjusting and finding ways around it. And so we had to take our technology and make it better. And we did that. And when we did that, we saw, I mean, they basically had a meltdown on these message boards. They were just like, oh my God, I don't know how to get around this. Like, I'm gonna have to get a real job, you know, da 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 da. And it made us so happy. And we were like, okay, we really have something here because we're really, you know, able to stop these guys. And then also when we finally got to the point where we had a run rate of a million dollars a year, like we, there was a picture of us. We were at a conference, like sitting at a uh, an, a, an exhibit hall at a conference um, when we hit the million dollar run rate. And uh, we were just so happy. We were like, oh, my God, this is a real business, you know. So I would say those two points were the main points. 
when nice. we knew it was going to work. So having a business background, you did an undergrad in business. What's the journey like doing a very technical mm -hmm. um, startup? And what was that path like? So you said you were dabbling in coding, trying to do technical stuff mm -hmm. when you joined the incubator. But what you're talking about seems like a lot heavier on the technical side to me than than just like a e-com side or like a, okay. a simple SaaS product, right? Yeah, the journey was interesting. It was not a journey that I expected for sure because when we started, we did have technical resources at the company. Thank God, because um, like like I said, when we started, we were doing phone calls with one-time passcodes rather than text messaging, and that is extremely complicated. Like I said, you have to have at the time you had to have these telecom lines hooked up to these special servers yeah. and uh to generate the call and so those technical resources were able to handle that when we started doing um text messaging i would say that's when i got more involved uh and really learned how um it, it wasn't just like coding i don't even know how to explain it but it, it's Part of it is coding um but the telecom network is extremely complicated so you know, I didn't know anything about it. No one at the company really knew any, anything about it. So how do you survive? You have to like dig in and learn how all of this works. So it was a lot of like finding vendors, talking to them, like figuring out in your mind, like what, you know, what, what they're saying actually means, because it's not like, they're not necessarily like on the level, what they're yeah, telling yeah. you. Um, and then digging into other types of vendors, like how does the telecom system work? Like who who are all these providers in the background? It's not just the SMS providers. It's like all of these other like lower level providers and just figuring out how it all works. So we were piecing it together as we went. Like we were learning as we went. We would do something and then it would work for a while and then it didn't work at scale and we'd have to like go learn something yeah. else. Yeah. So we were constantly figuring out everything and the how things were working in the background and then that would change our system a lot like we ended up buying a company in 2012 based out of serbia because they had a direct telecom connection because we had learned so much at that point we were like we need to be hooked fully in to like the ss7 network which is like the under like what undergirds all of the telecom system and they had that connection so we we made it far from where we started, which was knowing nothing. <laughs> you mentioned you had three co-founders in total, including yourself, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. How and none of you were technical or partially technical or I was the most technical. So me. how did you guys decide roles and responsibilities when when the turning point came? We're like, OK, Telesign is becoming the thing. We're going to like make it its own dedicated and just focus on that full time yeah how did you guys decide and split responsibilities we were lucky in that the three of us are so different like there was never even really a question as right. to like what we would do because i'm like the more technical one you know focus more on like product and tech one of us is very like people oriented salesy likes to like go out and talk to the clients never takes no for type. an answer yeah say, like more of a salesy you know could be ceo and the other one is very i would say like operational yeah. actually he might be more of the ceo type because he's more operational he likes to like move the pieces around of the company put this Got person it. here that person there like org structure all of that stuff and so it just it just like worked okay. out so well. It was kind of like okay. a little miracle. <laughs> the reason I ask is co-founder conflict is one of the l highest reasons of startup failure. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, again, don't understand the relationship they're getting into. And mm -hmm. um, it sounds like you had a really good understanding with your co-founders from early on, right? Well, whether that was by chance or by design, but it was something that happened um, yeah. with the incubator as well. A hundred percent. And if I was going to do it again, I would be looking for the same type of thing. I think some people tend to look for people that are like them, but you don't really want someone like you. You want someone that you can be honest with and talk to. So they're like you in that sense, but you need completely different skills. Yeah. Um, I didn't know there was a thing. I went to SF in January and I met a lot of folks who are co-founder dating and I was like, okay, this is interesting. Like folks are getting into one month, two month, three month, like 
project arrangements where like someone has an idea or they're like, hey, I want to find the right person to work with, even mm-hmm. if it's a different idea. Okay. And so they're getting into like predefined engagements. Yeah. Like, hey, let's do this for two, three months. See if we vibe together or not vibe. Yeah. And then take the leap in. Um, I'm like, okay, interesting. Like, I, I, I didn't even know that was a yeah. thing. But, um, <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> um, and interesting because um, I think uh, people have said even like YC applications, they focus on the co-founder relationship a lot mm-hmm. more than whether your idea is like the best idea in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, That makes sense. But no, that makes sense that building a company with the right person, I think matters a lot Mm -hmm. and can take a mediocre idea and still make it a big company. Mm -hmm. But a bad relationship can take a really good idea and just like burn it to the ground. For sure. And which is maybe the most likely outcome too, you know, because personalities don't always work together. I think we also worked out really well because we balanced. It wasn't just like it wasn't just skills. It was also just like personality type. Like when my when I was down, my co-founders were up. When they were down, I was up. It was just like this crazy balance, but it's not easy to find that. Makes sense. So you you guys decide to go telesign full time. What does that transition look like? Um, did you move out of the incubator are you still affiliated with the incubator like can you talk through that process a little bit yeah we did it in a very slow way so the first thing that we did was we just took another office in the same building so we were it's almost like having a child and having them just sort of like move out to like the garage you know the pool house or something like that we're still very close we could still you know if we needed a resource out of the incubator we could still use it um so we had some shared resources still um but we were you know on our own doing our own thing up there um and then we moved then we got then we brought in more people so new employees that were not from the incubator so we had to get a bigger space so we moved to another office still in the same building bigger um and then finally we were like okay this is a real company like we need to just totally separate and so in order to do that we just sort of figured out which resources it made the most sense would stay with the telesign and which ones would stay with the incubator um, so we figured that out, and then we moved to a totally different space, totally different building, not even close to the original incubator. So it was like a real um, separation at that point. Nice. When starting companies and in incubators, and this is probably just more a learning question for me, how does um, like registration work in terms of are you guys registering a C-Corp? Is the incubator doing it? Or... How does the logistics work in terms of when you're building a company inside of an incubator? Yeah. Um, who technically owns? Oh, I don't know. I'm just very curious. So. I think it would be different now than it was back then. So back then, our mentor handled basically all of the like nitty gritty on the you know legal doc side. So he dealt with the registering the C corp. Actually. It was registered as an S corp at first. A long story short, never make that mistake. That was a huge mistake. So you didn't do the eighty three B that you're supposed to do. Uh, we just didn't. We ended up not qualifying for the QSBS, which okay. is hey, oh hey, my god, the hey. worst thing ever. So never do that. Always start as a C corp. Um, and uh, yeah. So anyway, he handled the nitty gritty of that. And um, but now I would say. If you're going into an incubator with an idea yourself that you're going to work on, which I think is how incubators work more now these days, you should go in. You should already have it registered at that point. Got it. Actually, I would just say register as soon as possible, purely for QSBS reasons, because it has a five-year wait on it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, QSBS is something I learned about recently. Um, Not that I'm actively building anything, but I think a lot of people underestimate the everyone's like oh i gotta build i gotta build and like they're focused on the idea and execution but these small things oh end up screwing you later on yes. if you end up building a billion dollar company it it does end up um hurting you later on right? yes and it's such like a small thing i mean it you know i guess depending on where you are a lot of people are in california so to register there is what like 800 dollars a year or something like that so people are just like oh let's wait but i if I mean, my recommendation would be just suck it up and do the registration because that starts the countdown. And then you have your if things go well, 
it's going to make a huge difference yeah. in the end. Yeah. And if you don't, it's going to be super painful. I can tell you from experience. <laughs> cool. And so you guys are moving out, uh, building your own teams. Do you remember key points in your scaling journey and whether they're revenue milestones, team milestones? Um, what was that experience like? And how did you have to grow both as an individual and sort of a leader in the company during those milestones? Yeah, we definitely had milestones. Um, so we actually brought in an outside CEO, Got which it. was interesting, um, who helped to basically to build out the team at the beginning. So he brought in people that he had worked with before and sort of formalized the organization. So I think that was a big step. At what point was that? That was in 2011 yeah. or late 2010, early 2011. Um so before the one million era, or like in the it was after. So we were already making okay. we were near ten million a year at that okay. point. So we were, we had it had grown a fair amount at that point. Um so we brought him in. That was definitely I mean, it was different, you know, not having the three of us calling the shots, yeah. right? Although we were still heavily involved. I mean, you know. Influential. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um another milestone would be when we started, so we had another client that was a big, well, several actually, but th this one in particular was a big client, um, big, like you would know their name, their huge company uh, based out of Seattle, if that's helpful at all. And we were working with them and um, basically trying to convince them that the phone number could be a good account identifier because everyone was using at the time username or email. Yeah. And we were like, why not phone number? Everyone has a phone number, basically. You know, text message is the most widely used technology in the world. And they don't change as often. Exactly. And it's, yeah. And it's just like, you know, it was a it was a novel concept at the time, but we really thought that it could be a winner. And so we were working with them, just sort of, you know, laying out all of the reasons why they should do this. And they were finally like, okay, yeah, let's do it. And so that was like a crazy milestone because we were like, you know, if they do it, then these a bunch okay. of other companies are going to do it and it's going to become a thing. And now it really has, which is kind of crazy. So that was a massive milestone. Um, and it took a lot of, you know, time and effort to sort of make the case for that. Another milestone was buying that company in Serbia, for sure. That was, uh, it worked out really, really well. We ended up growing a huge team out there. Right. Um, that they ended up being the biggest office actually in the end. So that worked out well. And then what else would be a milestone? I guess selling the company, you know, obviously yeah. a huge milestone. Um, and there was a lot of stuff in between, obviously, that I'm skipping over, but I don't even, some of it has left my mind. I'm sure it'll get jogged at yeah. some point. Um, is there is there any one or two points that were particular, um, like, downtimes for you in this journey of mm. building and scaling that, you're like, oh, like something's not going right and it just um, didn't. <laughs> yeah, like every day, basically. <laughs> there was always something not going right. So, um, man, where to start? <laughs> there. So we were a cost center for our, all of our clients. Yeah. Um, we're, you know, when you're selling a fraud prevention service, you're not helping the company make money. You're 100%. helping them ideally avoid losing Something money more. or lose reputation or have reputational damage or whatever and so our clients were always hammering us on the price they yeah. were just like we're spending too much da, 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 da. so we were always just on the edge of like are they gonna figure out some other way to do this yeah. you know i mean that was like daily basically is fraud prevention so like when there's times of like economic downturn and companies are like um you know uh cleaning up the books and getting rid of cost centers is fraud prevention like high on the list of like, hey, we get rid of this first or is it like w very well protected in terms of it's one of the last things to go if we need to? We're lucky it was one of the last things Got to it. go. They Got keep it. that and fraud actually tends to pick up in periods of economic yeah. downturn because people find other ways to make money. And so um, so we were lucky like 2008. We didn't even really feel it. We, we just chugged on along pretty much the same as it had been before. Um, so yeah, we didn't see any real sensitivity in the, um, when it came to the economic, like the economy, um, except like if a business just went out of business, right. If they were no longer there. But, uh, but other than that, no, we didn't see any real sensitivity. 
after after leaving the incubator, did you guys raise a lot of money outside of whatever the incubator had put in? Did you have multiple rounds mm -hmm. to sort of grow hyperscale or were you more or less bootstrapped and profitable throughout? So we were bootstrapped and profitable, but in 2012, when we bought the Serbian company, we raised around because we didn't have enough to actually purchase the company. So yeah. we raised around purely for the purpose of being able to purchase that company. And then a few years after that, um, we raised another round that we didn't need, to be quite frank. I was actually against raising that round, but we did. We did it. Um, so we did take a Series B. It was like around $50 million and honestly didn't end up doing really anything with it. Yeah, it was... I don't know, but um, so we four percent in the bank or whatever. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, back then it was like point, you know, oh five percent. It was nothing. So, but anyways, so we did take two rounds, but they were, I would say, unusual rounds. They weren't uh, like to stay alive yeah. or anything like that. They weren't runway inducing rounds, or they weren't like growth related. Rounds. Exactly. And the, the reason I ask is I just wanted to uh, ask if there was ever any investor pressure on the decisions you guys made because. Um, one thing I also want to try to highlight in the episodes I'm doing is when people raise, how much of the company's trajectory changes because of investor pressure versus how much if it stays true to whatever the founder needs. But I'm guessing in this case, there wasn't a lot of investor pressure. There was because there was no need for money. You were never in a position to yeah. need to do what the investors said. There really wasn't much investor pressure at all, to be honest. I mean, we had board meetings. They were very positive board meetings. And I mean, in some cases, we could have used some investor pressure, <laughs> to be honest with you, especially during certain times of the company. Um, but no, we never, we never really had much investor pressure at all. Uh, so I think, again, we're kind of an unusual case. Uh, I think in many ways, we got just sort of lucky with the way the business went. Makes sense. Um, did the external CEO stay on until the sale of the company or? No, he um, was, he left in about a year I want to say around a year before we sold the company, maybe a year and a half, two years, something like that. Uh, so it was a little bit before. And then one of you guys took on CEO role or? So we actually had another guy come in as the CEO for until we sold the company. And then after we sold the company, one of us, the operational one of us took over as a CEO, okay. which was actually kind of funny um, because at that point it was owned by someone like it was telecom. more yeah. a business unit head. Versus mm. a, uh, the reason I ask is. What made you guys decide to bring in an external person? Mm -hmm. And I know you mentioned team building and you wanted someone to like, you know, build out a better, better team. But um, I'm just trying to highlight what skill sets did you guys think you guys were missing? I'm assuming you were, yeah. you came to some conclusions that, hey, I think we need someone who's good at X that we're not good at to bring in and like. Um, yeah, it's a good question. And what we were thinking at the time I would give totally different advice to what to people these days. So we, what we were thinking at the time was we were super young. We were like early 20s at that point um, or mid 20s, whatever. We were super young. And I don't know. I just feel like and kids these days might not be the same as we were. But we were just like it always feels like you can you don't know. What you, know. what you need to know to yeah, like 100%. go to the next level you can bring someone in and they know more than you and like they'll make it happen and da 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 i don't really think that's true now i think that you could do just as well on your own um with maybe like some you know additional like mentor advisor type of help i don't really think that we needed to bring an external ceo but at the time it just seemed like I mean, in our heads, we were like, well, we don't really know what we're doing. Let's bring in someone who knows what they're doing and uh, and and go from there. Makes so sense. that's why we did it. Makes sense. Um, I do agree that nowadays there is a lot of access to information, mentors, advisors. Mm -hmm. I also feel like founders should understand where their skill set lies. I think on a previous episode, I was talking about 
you you're either good at zero to one or one to ten mm -hmm. or ten to hundred. Maybe you're good at two of these, mm -hmm. but it's very hard to be good at like zero to one billion. For sure. Because they're very different skill sets. But after a time, it becomes about scalable systems and orgs and not about like product market fit and customer mentality. And like if you understand where you lie, mm -hmm. you can bring in the systems in place when you need to. One thing I wanted to ask was during the journey, at what point did you guys decide to want to sell and why did that come on the table? So it's a really good question. And I think that people will always second guess the decisions that you make, right? Um, without getting into too much detail, we had a lot of sort of internal drama at the company at a certain point, and it was getting more and more difficult to get things done in a positive way. Um, and, and our revenue, uh, was because of that, frankly, our revenue was sort of plateauing and we were just like, what's going to happen with this company? It always seemed like every day just seemed like an existential crisis at some point. And we were like, okay, we need to figure out what we're going to do with this. I mean, we had already been in it for starting in 2005 to 2017 when we sold us 12 years. That's a long time to be in a company yeah. literally from like starting basically day one Well, starting the day we started doing SMS people were just like, well, SMS is going to die. Everyone's going to be using first it was Skype. And then it was like, um, what's up and da da da. Like it was always, it just always seemed like something was going to put the company out of business could happen any day. And so we were just like, okay, let's take our, you know, let's take, something off the like let's take it off the table like our entire net worth is basically tied up in this one oh, company yeah. that we've been working on forever you know like we need to like we can't if it goes out of business we're yeah, gonna have yeah. a real and i'm assuming no one's taken secondaries at this point we did take a little off the table yeah. at one point but it wasn't that much yeah, yeah. and so we we're just like we can't we cannot continue this way with all of this stress. makes sense uh, so that's why we decided to look around and see if there was anything out there, anyone who would want to like do a, you know, do a purchase. Um, yeah. So how does that yeah. process go about? How does like, do you call a broker or a bank? Like, I have no idea how that goes about. We used an investment banker essentially that did sort of run a process. Um, but we also, you know, talked to clients, talked to vendors, talked to whoever sort of reach out inside the industry and like softly let it be known you don't want to tell the world yeah. um but uh but yeah so we talked to various people about whether it could be interesting also you want to do it from a position of power not a position of ideally like, yeah sure yeah. ideally <laughs> um, I, I listened to a couple of podcasts where they talk about negotiations and one of the things they say is whoever can be the most uncomfortable in the room mm -hmm. is probably gonna like get what they want out of the negotiation that's right. if if the other person knows that hey you guys are looking for an exit they can probably strong arm you but um that yeah. makes a lot of sense yeah and i would definitely agree with that it's true and it was not an easy process either it took a full year to sell like once we had a buyer it took a full year to actually sell the company there was a lot of due diligence involved there was a lot of like oh is this client gonna like we're saying this client is going to sign in August. Do they actually sign in August? Yeah. You know what I mean? And we actually also went through the CFIUS process, which, oh my God, don't... Which process? It's called CFIUS. It's if you get purchased by a foreign company... Got it. That you can, you or that company can decide to go through this process where you basically get approval by the U.S. government for the sale. Um, and because we were bought by a Belgian telecom, which is, you know, Belgian telecom extremely conservative and they're buying a, a cybersecurity company more or less they were like well we don't want it to get unwound later because the u.s government decides that there can't be a foreign owner of a cybersecurity company yeah, yeah, yeah. so we're going to do the CFIUS process so you submit um and you ask the u.s government like can you please give your approval mm -hmm. and say that you're not ever going to come back later and change your mind and so we did that and it took the for it took I don't even remember. There was a first round. It was it was like three months. And then they're like, OK, we have to extend it. It went to six months. And then at the day before that six month, they said they were going to approve it. 
the next day they said they changed their mind and they weren't going to approve it and we had to reapply so it's this i mean and the amount of stress during this process because you don't know what's going on they don't give you feedback yeah. like why the they're u.s not government it. is known for yeah. no visibility <laughs> exactly so. so we're just like oh my god it was extremely stressful and is the onus on you to get that approval or is it on the buying company to get the approval or i mean both it's on whoever can make it happen it. and any either one, also you're more incentivized to we're i guess more in, i think both sides are pretty incentivized so we didn't care actually if they did the stiffiest process they're the ones that decided that they wanted to do it and then once they decided they wanted to do it and submitted then it was on both of us to get it done it makes sense but like how you do that is another question you know unless you have a direct line to the state department there's not a whole lot that you can do and is this a very common process or is it a because the first time i've heard of this but it's not i mean if you get purchased by a u.s company then no it, you never okay. have to do that it's only if you get purchased by a foreign company so it's not so common and it wouldn't even be for just like a some random company getting purchased it's more like if you have um something that could be important to u.s interests so like Got cybersecurity is it. one and Got there's it. various others Got it. Makes sense. So you guys decide to sell. You find a buyer. It takes a year in the process. Um, is the company growing at that point? Is the company more like where is your guys' energy during this process? So the company actually we did. I mean, we signed a couple of really large clients during that process. So that was great. Um, so we there was a lot of energy that went into the due diligence, but the company was still quite functional at the time because it was big it wasn't yeah. like you know it wasn't like just like 20 people or something trying to make it happen there was hundreds of people yeah. it kept ticking along like i it didn't really feel like we were taking the eye off the ball so much makes as sense. it would if you had a smaller company or trying to go through this makes sense and during the sale did all of you guys have to stay on i know in most sales there's like hey stay on for two years three years sort mm -hmm. of arrangement um is the founding team staying on or w what kind of deal did you guys come to uh, if you hit certain milestones after the sale um you then invest you, more equity or whatever it was just a direct payment yeah, yeah. yeah um so it was like you could stay on up to three years um or that those targets were up to three years out i should say but you only got it if you stayed on right so um so one of us darren left after six months a year he was the first to leave I stayed on for the full three years. And then Ryan, who was the operational guy, stayed on. He was the CEO at that point and stayed on um, a little bit after me. Got it. Yeah. So we we actually stayed a fair amount of time. It was really interesting to see. Like, I was enjoying seeing the integration because it's just another part of the process that you don't get to see yeah. before you get bought. Like, how this big company works, how they're going to integrate you, if it's going to work out, like, how the companies are going to work together. And it was interesting to see how, you know, see it in play out. What was it like to go from founding, being co-founder, sort of leading a company to being bought out now? technically having a boss but also being on the other side of like you're not on the hook as much for yeah. the growth yeah but you're also a little like i mean you're sort of in between but what, what was the difference what was the biggest change there it was a lot less stress but also like kind of depressing <laughs> like because it's like your baby is kind of gone it's not yeah. really yours anymore you're not making the calls every day um and to be like really honest, it's way less motiva motivational. Like I don't really understand. I mean, this will kill like my career ever getting hired anywhere for real. But like, I don't really understand how people just work at companies yeah. because what is your motivation? You know, there is a lot of motivation when you have a piece of the company and you're like 100%. talking to these big clients and you're like, if they sign on, like the value of the company is going to go way up. Da -da 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 -da. But once you're sold, it's just like why am I here? <laughs> you know, you're learning. You're like, it's interesting to see. You see different systems at scale, but. Yeah. Yeah. It was just way less motivational at that point. I don't remember who I was listening to, but they were saying in their own company, bringing on a hundred K of yearly revenue 
is bringing on 500k of value mm-hmm. versus as an employee if i bring in 100k depending on my role maybe i just make 10% of that or i'm still getting the same paycheck right irrespective of whether yeah. i bring in the 100k or not and so it's a very different perspective but again i think it's the risk factor right like yes. um hypothetically let's say telesign didn't work out you had full a lot of your net worth invested in 12 13 years i think it's that notion of there's a there's a higher probability doesn't work out which mm-hmm. is what deters yeah that's my my guess on why people don't take the risk but i think you're 100% right and i totally get it for the vast majority of people for me i need the pressure 100%. <laughs> but i i definitely get it cuz it is a lot of stress and it is like I mean, you could feel it. It yeah. just, it literally feels different. One thing I was going to ask you is, do you have some ideas in the identity fraud cyberspace um, that you think are viable ideas that you're not working on, but um, that someone could look into? Nothing that specifically like jumps to the top of my head, but I'm sure there are, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of things that could be done. Like, I mean, everybody knows that bots are a problem um, and there's different ways to try to combat that right now. But it's just, yeah, I don't honestly, I don't have a good I don't have a good response for it. That's fine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Just while talking, it was something that I thought um, I would ask. Actually, I have one other. Yeah. I think the generative AI space is going to be a big problem for humanity yeah and so finding ways to identify when something is generated generated is yeah if it's not just identifying real versus real i think is real versus not real is a huge opportunity i was listening to a snippet what some teacher did was she wanted to prevent her kids from using prompts Mm -hmm. so she wrote a whole like an essay prompt Mm -hmm. but then she wrote some text that used the words frankenstein but like white it out the text uh-huh. so that when you copy it um, and paste it in chat GPT, yeah. it comes up as use the word Frankenstein. So she, and I was like, now I don't know how much of this, it's like a random uh, <laughs> video I watched, yeah. but I was like, that's a very dumb way to like catch someone. Mm-hmm. And if kids are stupid enough to like not uh, sp- <laughs> like spell check their work, yeah, um, it's a very easy way to, but I, I do agree that it's pretty it is going to be a problem. I just don't know how people I, I've looked into this a little bit. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there's a way off the top of my head. I don't know if there's a way to totally agree with you. The biggest question is, even if it's just I use Gen AI for 90 percent of the work and then I put my own spin on it. Mm-hmm. Is that still considered like cheating, unreal, not real? I don't know. Right. Um, like, where do you draw the line of like, yeah, completely Gen AI versus like, yeah, I think it's a really good question. And it's. I think in a lot of cases like that, it's going to be okay to use Gen AI. This is my own personal opinion because it just becomes like a tool at that point. It's helping you be better, be faster, whatever. I think where there starts to be a problem is when a picture is totally fake and it's showing something, it's exploiting someone one way or another, or a video is totally fake, or fraudsters are able now to sound much more natural because maybe they're based in another country and they don't speak perfect English, but now it sounds like they speak this like excellent English, you know, or, I mean, it's just like, you can just generate so much content just automatically that if you're a good fraudster or I actually heard about them (laughs) asking, um, I think, I guess it was Chad GBT to generate, the non-coders to basically generate exploits it's like okay well now even the non-coders can generate an exploit Exploit, so well i mean it's yeah i also think um i think the biggest problem space outside of just gen ai is the amount of regressions so like if i could try five exploits Mm -hmm. with gen ai and now have the option to try ten thousand variations yes within a split second because i can now come up with ten thousand variations Mm -hmm. and i have systems in place to test those out and generate code to like exploit those um so it becomes harder um i went to the texas venture gal a couple weeks ago and i met someone and i'm like what do you do he's like i represent a company that does quantum encryption so interesting and i was like what's that he's like well 
with the level of supercomputers we have today, if we go one level above, you can basically decrypt anything. So quantum encryption is like, yeah, prevent, I'm like, okay, that's like, it's so above my head that I'm just like, I don't even, <laughs> but like, someone's looking into it. Someone, yeah. someone cares about this, right? So, well, and it sounds like, my takeaway from that is that it's needed now. Like you should actually start doing quantum encryption on your stuff now, not to like be a spokesperson for this person, but basically it sounds like there are people, countries, like various entities that are just sucking down large amounts of encrypted information, yeah. knowing that they can't crack it now, but that they eventually, will. yeah, they'll be able to. And God knows like what information is in there that they'll yeah. be able to use at that point. My my take on all of this is just try not to be a target for someone. Yes, hundred percent. Because I I fundamentally believe that if someone wants to hack, get my, like break into whatever I have, I can't do much to stop them. No. So my goal is like just not to be a target. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm not. I'm no one important. I'm just someone on the side. It's um, a, a good uh, good strategy. Security by obscurity, they call it. I didn't know there was a term. Mm, okay. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I wanted to ask was, you've been um, running Telesign uh, for almost 12 years plus more as advisor capacity. Mm -hmm. What's been your support system throughout? It was really my two co-founders. They were, I got so lucky with them. They were so great. We had a WhatsApp chat group. We still have it. Like we still chat quite often and we were just constantly on that talking about you know, whatever we need to talk about. Um, of course, I have my family, parents, I have a dog, I have friends. But really, it's hard for people to understand what you're going through if they're not in it. Um, may, you know, maybe if they're a co-founder of a company, they can like understand. But other than that, it's such like different problems than most people have on a daily basis that really having those two was super, super important and helpful. What are three resources that you would recommend to founders who are building today? And this could be podcast books, resources, anything. And if they're specific to the identity fraud, cyberspace better. But if not, that's also fine. Man, three resources. That's a good question. And I just feel like everyone has it so easy today. <laughs> it's like, I don't even really have three specific resources. I would just say to anyone, like anyone out there, you're so lucky because you have things like AWS that you can build on top of AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, whatever, all of them. And like all of the ones that make it even easier than that now, like Vercel and all of these different platforms that we had none of. So, um, uh, just be happy that you have those things and then just such a wealth of resources as far as, and I don't really have any specific ones just like all of the pot like you you know podcasts like this that you can listen to and get advice um, and even just like LinkedIn as a resource too people maybe underestimate it or maybe they don't I don't know but just being able to reach out Find the people who have knowledge in your space, reach out to them, you know, hit them cold, get feedback from them. A lot of times people do want to help and like they will respond. And, you know, uh, even if they even if it's like not a ton of help, like they'll in many cases give good feedback. So I would just say take advantage of every you know everything that's out there because they're used to it. What well, it hasn't always been like this. There yeah. wasn't always so much information available. One thing I try to do is if there's folks who are like very cold connections, mm -hmm. I'll send a cold DM and I'll just send updates every once in a while. Like, mm -hmm. hey, here's a, oh, like, hey, great episode. Or like, I saw that. Yeah. With no intention of ever expecting anything. Um, and if there ever is a reply, then I can yeah be like, hey, um, I, w I would love your take on blah, blah, blah. Right. It's yeah, um, a really good strategy. One and. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say one other thing our top sales guy used to do back in the day. He was a freaking genius. He would go on LinkedIn and basically straight up stalk people and see like what their normal posting cadence is and how often they were connecting to people. And then he would know if they stopped connecting for like a week, he'd be like, they must be on vacation. I'm going to leave them alone right now. Or he'd be like, oh, they just connected to a recruiter. They're going to jump to another like yeah. company. I need to make better connections like yeah. beyond them. Yeah. Like he's just so the amount of like if you get creative, <laughs> the amount yeah. of stalking yeah. you can do and really figure out like 
when the best time to reach out to people is and stuff like that. It's really interesting. I I, I met a guy in Austin who's building a LinkedIn based HR tech company, mm-hmm. which basically works with recruiters and tells them if your employees are looking elsewhere. Yeah, and it's all in in inference based. Yep. But hiring an employee is expensive. Yep. And onboarding them is expensive. And so if they're looking within six months, you want to try to figure out why. Right. And so I'm like, it's a very interesting take on trying to do like behavior analysis of like, okay, so what is this guy doing? Like, is he looking for jobs? Like, why is he like, what's the problem? Like, go try to plug that leak instead of. So valuable. um, Yeah. But no, um, the amount of data available, I think there's a lot of stuff that people can do. It's just, I think, a matter of how do you take action? Mm -hmm. Um. You consume a lot. Like, I consume a lot of data. Mm-hmm. But I think it also comes down to what of those can I take and then take action on and actually build something out of, right? A hundred percent. And you have to be really good at sorting data now, too, because there's such an overload. And you don't necessarily know who knows what they're talking about. Yeah. Because some people just are, feels like they're just, right. And they're just kind of generating content. They always need new topics. And like, who knows if they, you know, if any of what they're saying actually works or whatever. I I constantly keep deleting my YouTube history Mm -hmm. because you realize over time that your YouTube feed will be very catered to the kinds of stuff you click on. Mm -hmm. And I just did it yesterday, and, like, now I'm seeing videos that I never saw on my feed before. That's so smart. Um, And so I just, like, every couple weeks, I'll just delete my full watch history. Yeah. So that I can get completely new. That's such a good idea. Um, Watch a couple too many um, EDC videos, Everyday Carry, and now my whole feed is just Everyday (laughs) Carry videos. I'm just like... (laughs) Um, one other question I had was what's, what was your startup stack or what is your current startup stack at the Stealth company? Um, so what tools are you using Mm -hmm. to build out the company? Um, so, uh, tools that I'm using to build out the company. I mean, just on the tech side, like I'm pretty old school. I don't really do all of the new Fancy tools. All the new, yeah, like fancy stuff. I just, so we're just starting to build. And so our backend is going to be like Python, you know, just like basic, the basic stuff. Um, Python with like a relational database. Like I, I freaking hate NoSQL database. Anyway, that's a whole yeah. other, I just, every that, that's the first thing developers want to use. They're like, we're going to use some kind of new JavaScript tech and a NoSQL database. I'm like, well, how am I going to look through that and find patterns? It's like nearly impossible. Anyways, um. So, yeah, we'll have a pretty basic tech stack. And then just as far as everything else, I mean, again, I'm pretty old school. I use, like, OneNote to, like, organize things. I know everyone uses Notion now. (laughs) I like OneNote. Um, (laughs) You know, stuff like that. I don't know. Uh, AWS and just the basics, you know, nothing too crazy. It's it's funny. I've had some founders on who are like, I'm just a Google Drive person. Right. Like, Like, just everything Google Suite, Google Drive. Google Docs and like Evernote. And I'm like, okay, interesting. Like simple stack. Yeah. You don't, um, you can get super efficient and do like Zapier automations, but yeah, I think no. it's very like person dependent. Yeah. Too many tools. Like I've tried Notion a lot and I feel like it's too much. Right. Um, at the end of the day, I just want a very simple system and every Notion template just complicates one. Or like I need this and then I have a subfolder and a project folder and this <laughs> folder and then I have a task folder and then a reminder folder. Yeah. I link my calendar and then like it's it's a little too dark. Like much. I'm a pen and paper person. I just walk around with a notebook and I cross stuff off and You know what works for works you. For me. Yeah. yeah. And like every now and then, you know, like you tried Notion. Like you try the new things and yeah. you know, it's not like you're just like, Oh, I'm never gonna use anything else, but you try it and you're like, This just doesn't work for me. Like I already have my yeah. system and it works really well and da da da. The only caveat of pen and paper is I can't search and look back. Well, you can get the new high tech pen and paper. Remarkable and yeah, stuff. That, yeah, that's so it'll go. That's one more thing to carry around. Though. That's true. That is true. Well, I used to have a pen and paper. I don't remember what this was called, but it was pretty neat. It was like really cool. It was a notepad that had like actual paper and it was a pen, Got but it. it recorded everything that you wrote. Yeah, I think I know which one. Yeah. Is. And then that went into OneNote or whatever, wherever you wanted to put it. And then it was searchable. So you had both. Um, so if you're the kind of person that wants to search for stuff by words, you can do it. Or if you're the kind of person that remembers like where you wrote something, um, then you can do that too, which was great. 
really like that. Um, I do this segment where I ask every guest their last question. Mm-hmm. So your question is, what are you afraid of? What's holding you? What's holding you back from the reality that you think could exist? Sweet. Ooh, that one is so deep. What are? You, what am I afraid of? I'm afraid of. I guess um, not reaching my potential, which is kind of where that question is going, I feel like. But maybe everyone sort of has this feeling that, like, you can do this or that in life. And are you on the track to get there? And um, it's hard to know if you are on that track or not, right? So that's kind of my, I guess, my, like, fear. Um, Yeah. That's I mean and uh what's holding you back from the reality you think can exist? What is holding me back? Um I don't really know. Twitter? <laughs> Maybe like spending a little bit too much time keeping up with what's like the event, the world events. Yeah. There's just so much going on and sometimes I feel like I just need to cut myself like off from everything that's happening. And you never really know, like, what's real, like, what's really happening. Yeah. Is it really a big deal or is it just the same thing that's been happening for hundreds of years, but we just didn't know about it? Um, so maybe, like, overthinking, like, paying too much attention to the world. Um, but other than that, I don't really uh, – holding me back. I don't really feel like I have, a, like, a fear that's holding me back necessarily. Um, good place to be in yeah i guess or maybe i'm just delusional and there is and i just i'm not identifying it (laughs) that's also a good place to be (laughs) um like the naiveness of just hey this is gonna work and it's i'm gonna build it and it's Mm -hmm. gonna make sense right Um, right i feel like sometimes founders at least like personally um i get stuck in analysis paralysis of like I know too much mm-hmm. about why something won't work. Sure. And I won't go do it because I'm like, here's every, like here's 10 reasons I know this is going to fail. Right. And so I'm not going to go start it. But like maybe I just need to go start it and not worry about those 10 things, right? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a such a balance. Yeah. It ain't gone down that path. Something that was so difficult and we didn't really know the industry. And, you know, everyone who was already in the industry was just like, this is stupid. It's never going to work. So you got to. You got to be naive to disrupt. You do. You do. Our mentor used to say something along the lines of like, you have to be crazy or stupid to to do stuff, to do this, you know, um, which is probably pretty true. <laughs> nice. Uh, what's a question you have for a future guest? Um, so basically, like, what was the most transformational experience that happened to you in a business sense, like at your business? Like, was there something that happened that really changed your perspective from one day to the next? Do you have an answer to that? I really, I think for for me, it was very much the experience with the big client when they said yes to the, yeah. like, phone as an identifier. That was a big, it was just, it was just like, oh, my God, we can actually convince these giant companies to totally change the way they're doing something and yeah. really, like, have, and it impacts, like, millions or billions of people it's crazy nice yeah cool um but thank you for coming on that's all the questions i have for you where can listeners find you where is there anything you want to plug anything you want to tell them about and we can link everything in the description i have no plugs i um uh, you can find me on linkedin that's basically it i don't really do social media like a normal person um <laughs> always the thing about being in cybersecurity is you're just like you don't really want to have all of your information out oh. there you get pretty sensitive to that stuff one of the biggest hurdles i had of starting this podcast was i'm I'm not a social media person mm-hmm. i don't post anywhere but i was like okay if i'm gonna put myself out there it's like a big change from and now i don't know what someone can do yeah. With um video and voice, you can do deep fakes and stuff. Again, I just don't want to be a target. Right. But um it's part of the part of the product. I mean what can you do? Yeah, what can you do? Um but that was a big hurt. I'm like, eh, I mean, if someone really wants to do something, they're gonna do it irrespective of That's true. Whether whether I do this podcast or not. 
I don't know. It is a big mental change to yeah. like be sort of totally in the background, yeah, which yeah, is one yeah. thing I always really liked about Telesign is people like they were like, oh, I've done that before, but I didn't know there was a company, yeah. you know, versus like the podcast. Yeah, You're yeah, like yeah, yeah. out in public and yeah. speaking to people. So big change. But yeah, we'll link everything in the description. But thank you for coming on. It was yeah. an amazing conversation. Awesome. Really enjoyed it. Thanks yeah. so much for having me.